and they loved their lives not to death. And that's going to come a bit of a theme today. So I'll just pray that the Lord will be with me. If you want to pray an eel as well. Gracious Heavenly Father, I pray that as uh, I share our journey of the last 10 months or so, that Father, you would, uh, one, help me to be able to share it and uh, calm my nerves. And Father, I pray that, Lord, that people would be touched. And Father, most of all, that they would uh, be pointed towards you. And Father, that Lord it would help them on their walk. Closer to you, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. The title of my message is, Are You the One? Are You the One that we had to come back for? And um, it's, that'll become clear as we go through. Um, this picture is one of my favourite pictures. It's on our lounge wall and it's on our screen savers. And it's Ellen White's first vision of the journey of God's people to the promised land. And how as we get towards the end of time, the path is going to get narrower and narrower. And um, I'm just going to ask my dear wife to come and uh, read the vision. And it might help us to... Uh, It could be. Um. Hello, good morning, everyone. <coughs> While at Battle Creek, Michigan in August 1868, I dreamed of being with a large body of people. A portion of this assembly started out prepared to journey. We had heavily loaded wagons. As we journeyed, the road seemed to ascend. On one side of this road was a deep precipice, on the other was a high, smooth, white wall. As we journeyed on, the road grew narrower and steeper. In some places, it seemed so very narrow that we concluded that we could no longer travel with the loaded wagons. We then loosed them from the horses, took a portion of the luggage from the wagons and placed it upon the horses and journeyed on horseback. As we progressed, the path still continued to narrow. We were obliged to press close to the wall to save ourselves from falling off the narrow road down the steep precipice. As we did this, the luggage on the horses pressed against the wall and caused us to sway toward the precipice. We feared that we should fall and be dashed in pieces on the rocks. We then cut the luggage from the horses and it fell over the precipice. We continued on horseback, greatly fearing as we came to the narrower places in the road that we should lose our balance and fall. At such times, a hand seemed to take the bridle and guide us over the perilous way. As the path grew more narrow, we decided that we could no longer go with safety on horseback, and we left the horses and went on foot in single file, one following in the footsteps of another. At this point, small cords were let down from the top of the pure white wall. These we eagerly grasped to aid us in keeping our balance upon the path. As we travelled, the cord moved along with us, the path finally became so narrow that we concluded that we could travel more safely without our shoes. So we slipped them from our feet and went on some distance without them. Soon it was decided that we could travel more safely without our stockings, or our socks we would say in these days. These were removed and we journeyed on with bare feet. We then thought of those who had not accustomed themselves to privations and hardships. Where were such now? They were not in the company. At every change, some were left behind, and those only remained who had accustomed themselves to endure hardships. The privations of the way only made these more eager to press on to the end. Our danger of falling down from the pathway increased. We pressed close to the white wall, yet could not place our feet fully upon the path, for it was too narrow. We then sup suspended nearly our whole weight upon the cords, exclaiming, we have hold from above, we have hold from above. The same words were uttered by all the company in the narrow pathway. As we heard the sounds of mirth and revelry that seemed to come from the abyss below, we shuddered. We heard the profane oath, the vulgar jest and low, vile songs. 
We heard the war song and the dance song. We heard instrumental music and loud laughter, mingled with cursing and cries of anguish and bitter wailing, and were more anxious than ever to keep upon the narrow, difficult pathway. Much of the time we were compelled to suspend our whole weight upon the cords, which increased in size as we progressed. I noticed that the beautiful white wall was stained with blood. It caused a feeling of regret to see the wall thus stained. This feeling, however, lasted but for a moment, as I soon thought that it was all as it should be. Those who were following after will know that others have passed the narrow, difficult way before them, and will conclude that if others were able to pursue their onward course, they can do the same. And as the blood shall be pressed from their aching feet, they will not faint with discouragement, but seeing the blood upon the wall, they will know that others have endured the same pain. At length we came to a large chasm at which our path ended. There was nothing now to guide the feet, nothing upon which to rest them. Our whole reliance must be upon the cords, which had increased in size until they were as large as our bodies. Here we were for a time thrown into perplexity and distress. We inquired in fearful whispers, To what is the cord attached? My husband was just before me. Large drops of sweat were falling from his brow. The veins in his neck and temples were increased to double their usual size, and suppressed agonising groans came from his lips. The sweat was dropping from my face, and I felt such anguish as I had never felt before. A fearful struggle was before us. Should we fail here, all the difficulties of our journey had been experienced for naught. Before us, on the other side of the chasm, was a beautiful field of green grass about six inches high. I could not see the sun, but bright, soft beams of light, resembling fine gold and silver, were resting upon this field. Nothing I had seen upon earth could compare in beauty and glory with this field. But could we succeed in reaching it, was the anxious inquiry. Should the cord break, we must perish. Again, in whispered anguish, the words were breathed, What holds the cord? For a moment, we hesitated to venture. Then we exclaimed, Our only hope is to trust wholly to the cord. It has been our dependence all the difficult way. It will not fail us now. Still, we were hesitating and distressed. The words were then spoken, God holds the cord. We need not fear. These words were then repeated by those behind us, accompanied with, He will not fail us now. He has brought us thus far in safety. My husband then swung himself over the fearful abyss into the beautiful field beyond. I immediately followed, and oh, what a sense of relief and gratitude to God we felt. I heard voices raised in triumphant praise to God. I was happy, perfectly happy. I awoke and found that from the anxiety I had experienced in passing over the difficult route, every nerve in my body seemed to be in a tremor. This dream needs no comment. It made such an impression upon my mind that probably every item in it will be vivid before me while my memory shall continue. So that was the end of her first vision. So nothing that this world has to offer can compare, even in the slightest, to what God has for us and to heaven, nor to the love that God has for each one of you. Just in brief, about eight years ago, God really challenged Brent and I to give up watching secular TV. We used to watch TV every night, pretty much. It might have been DIY shows, wholesome shows, you might say, but it was still just wasting time. We could have been doing something else, doing some Bible reading or something. Anyway, shortly after that, a few months after that, maybe we felt God say, now give up your business. So we did. We had a development company. We gave that up. Shortly after that, he said, now give up your home. Go live in a motorhome. And for me, it was my dream home. We'd only been there probably just under two years. And um, it was a lifestyle block. And we'd planted fruit trees and nut trees. And we thought we were going to be there till the end. But um, God said, now give this up too. And I'll never forget, oh, we lived in the motorhome for about five years. And I'll never forget Brent saying to me one night, you realise, darling, that nothing in this lounge we can take with us. The the leather lounge suite, the big screen TV, all the trimmings. We can't take this with us in the motorhome. You know that, eh? And I go, yeah, I know, and I don't care. And I truly, I didn't, because it started with the TV. All the secularism, all the, all the consumerism dropped away when we stopped watching that stuff. Thank you. Thank you. So this vision uh, tells us that along our journey, we're going to have to give up stuff. And for us, it was 
our house. Um, and our journey over the last 10 months, there's things we've had to give up too. And um, I think the biggest wagon we had to get rid of, which was the smallest thing, was the TV. Because that distracted us from God. Just before I start out, um, I'm going to try and use I statements because I, I really don't want to point fingers at anybody. And um, yeah, if anybody's challenged by anything I say, I pray that you'd ask God what you need to do about it. Um, yeah. Because I not only see this, this vision of Mrs. White's to do with our physical possessions and giving those up, but I see it as our character. And we all have character traits that are not fit for heaven. And God is asking us to give up some of our character traits with his help and by his grace. Paul says, I die daily. Unfortunately, I have to die thought by thought because I don't last a day. Um, yeah, it is definitely thought by thought. And if I'm not dead to self, then it is harder for me to be obedient. And if I don't die thought by thought, I easily think I'm a little God. And there's only room for one God in heaven, and it is the one true God. So some of our learnings have come out of uh, this book. Many of you would have heard of Dr. Hoysmuller. This was written by one of his students, Dr. Mark Sandeville and we'll be sharing some of the principles from this book, which is really learning to trust God and dying to self. Our testimony is based of what we learnt at Taste and See, and there might be some familiar faces there. A few of them are in this room. And uh, one of the things we learnt up there is how to read our Bible. This is a picture of my new Bible. I tend to now read, um, it's a parallel Bible, so I ring the <coughs> King James by one verse at a time, and then I read the parallel uh, Amplified Bible one verse at a time. Because for those who don't know, I didn't learn to read or write till I became a Christian at the age of 27. So I still struggle. But the testimony of that is, I'm living proof that no matter what our disability is, we can achieve stuff. Um, and what I found with this, it gives me a lot better understanding because we're actually reading every verse twice. And I've learnt, and I'm sure Mrs White said it, but I couldn't find it, that um, it is better to read one verse with understanding than books with no understanding. And I used to have the belief that we had to read so many chapters a day and, and I tried to do the right thing but I didn't get a lot of understanding. So that's one of the big changes I've made and uh, we get so much out of it and that's a typical page, there's quite a lot of underlying there. Our journey, the, the journey that we've been on has been about 10 months uh, ago as most of you know here, but people online might not realise that we used to live here, right next door to where we are now, and we grew our own vegetables. And that's some of our gardens. We got used to the nice cold winter sunrises. Um, and the next part of our journey started in February 2003. At, sorry, 2023 at Sam's cooking school class. And Sam and Joan had started joking about us going and helping her in her ministry. And I wasn't quite so keen because I'd spent a lot of time setting up the little place next door and we we're off grid and pretty self-sufficient. And I didn't like the thought of having to do that again. Another six months of getting ready. So I was a little bit hesitant, so I said, if God wants us up with Sam, 
he better tell Tani and Sergey that to come and tell me that they're leaving because there's no way I'm moving them out of our house. They're from the Ukraine and they just brought their family out and um, they've been good to us and uh, so there was no way I was ever going to say that, look, you have to move on. And we came back the first morning after we got back from the cooking school, Sergei came over to me and he said, um, just letting you know that we're having to leave. And I said something like, oh no, I think we're going too then. <laughs> oh, and in the meantime, Joanna had said to me, why did I have to make the fleece so hard? Um, but I didn't want to go. Uh, for a lot of reasons I didn't want to go. Um, so we moved to Taste and See, and here, 11 months ago in April 2023, since that time, We've learned a lot from Sam with, the work for walk, with our walk with God. See, I knew a lot of the theory, and uh, some of the theory I knew, it sounded good in theory, but I didn't, I didn't believe it was possible in practice. Her favourite uh, motto is, and what her ministry is based on, is taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. And for those that have been to the cooking schools, it's actually nothing to do with cooking. It's about our spiritual walk. And it's quite challenging. And I'd have to say one of the most spiritual uh, events I've ever been to. So even if you don't like cooking, but you like food because there's good food there, um, my recommendation is go there because uh, it's an intense, it's only a week, but it's life changing. And uh, it's a beautiful place. This is the sun rising in the valley below us. Um, there's cooking classes which we saw before. There's lots of cooking. There's yummy food. And get to eat a lot of food. <coughs> Um, there's the accommodation, and that's from another angle. That was taken the morning we left, actually. And you can see in the front here, there's three, well, you can't quite see the third lot of cabins, but there's three sets of cabins there. A little church over on the right where we have worship. Mm. And this is a picture of uh, our place behind the tree stump. The morning that we left at sunrise. So Sam's over to the right. And we're the left, and we're quite private, but yet quite close. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever that believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. As Sam would say, we're all part of the family of whosoever's. And I pray that... Um, Everyone here is, will make that choice to be part of that family. And her response to John 3.16 is, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, but not I. It's Christ which liveth in me, and the life I now live is in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God. Most translations say, in the Son of God, but it's not even our faith, it's God's faith that we have to live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When we grasp the love of God, it makes it so much easier to surrender it all and to die to self. Paul says somewhere that uh, there's, you know, a lot of people say that we're legalists because we keep the Sabbath and what have you. But Paul says it's the law of liberty Amen. and I've never been so free. We cannot obey if we are not surrendered and we can't surrender if, if we're not dead to self. So this journey on the path is really a journey of surrender, giving up for God. But ironically, we lose nothing. The World Economic Forum has a saying in their 2030 agenda, you'll own nothing and be happy. And that used to really annoy me. 
But then God actually showed me there a couple of weeks ago that that's such an old yesterday saying. Because with God, we own nothing and we're happy. It's all his. And he graciously allows us the use of it. We've learned just to realise how much God loves us. As she would say to you, do you know that Jesus really loves you? And I've come to learn uh, as well that there's not a, a moment in time when God is not thinking of us. Each one in this room, he's thought about from the time of creation. And this is a little sign that she put up at the bottom of our drive just to remind us every day that we should put a smile on our face and that Jesus is truly in love with us. This is our little home that we set up there. Um, I want to share this bit because it becomes relevant and I'm not sharing this little bit to show off but to show you uh, one of the wagons that we had to give up. So um, we were totally off grid there. We got a three bedroom tiny home. So this is um, our lounge and kitchen, two bedrooms, and there's a bedroom behind the windmill that doesn't work, and uh, solar panels on the roof. We almost lost the roof the first week we were there. I was in the shed, and we get horrendous winds up, up there, and I went in there, and the roof's pulsing up about 70 mil and up and down in the air, and so I put some straps around it and tied it to the beams, and... I was in there a few minutes later and I heard this big crack and I looked up and the beams are now going up and down and I'd just put some solar panels on there so and all of our furniture was in there. So there was a lot of miracles that day. We'd just happened to have concreted a couple of days before and I'd brought a whole lot of truck strops for moving our furniture so I managed to tie the roof down to the bottom of the beams and uh, now it's bolted with walls down to the floor that's not going anywhere. So when we went there, that was the back of the barn where the cabins are. Then we painted it and had it levelled. Sergei would remember it looking like that. Um, we concreted the floor. We put in some power system. That was before it was finished. Some solar panels. We had uh, inverters to run the cars and one for the house. And then we brought some cabins in. And that's our lounge and kitchen going in. And that's what it looks like from the second bedroom. And that's Joanna's bedroom. Um, not bedroom, sorry. <laughs> kitchen. <laughs> sorry about my nerves. And that's uh, a bit of a wet day, but that was our view. Rainbow in the background. Still a nice view. And we even dug a well. There was a well for the main house uh, for spring water. And it just comes out of the ground there. So I dug this for our gardens. And there's about a thousand litres of storage under there. And ra what was amazing, the day that we left, or just the day before, I was going to water the, the trees for the trip down here. We brought some blueberry bushes and stuff. And the spring run dry. Mm. And it was like God said to me, this is not needed now. But I believe when somebody else goes there, it will start up again. Um, and it's part of learning that God will supply our needs. Because as we journey up this path, and we have to hang on to the ropes at the other end. It's all about getting used to the fact God supplies. So we moved up about, oh sorry, then about seven months after being there, God started us to drop little hints that we were to come back. And I can assure you, I wasn't excessively happy. In fact, I was not a happy at all. Because I've you've seen the work I just put in and... And um, anyway, for me, it was a little slice of heaven on earth. I had the biggest workshop I've ever had. 
we had a nice new tiny home that was a lot bigger than the tiny home we have here. Um, and it just didn't make sense to me. Why would God get us to put all that together and then walk away? But on Friday, the 26th of January, just it's just a month ago now, I think, God finally got through uh, and said that we needed to move. And by the Sunday, the 28th, we were doing our first load back. Um, that night, the Thursday night, I was up till 4 a.m. in the morning. I went to bed, but I couldn't sleep because I was pretty annoyed with God because I didn't have any understanding of what he was asking me to do. And it didn't make sense. And um, actually, I'll wait a couple of slides to share that because I need to show you another picture first or otherwise it won't look so good. But people ask, keep asking us, do we have a Barney? And my answer is absolutely not. Sam didn't want to see us to go. They were in pretty broken. And we didn't want to go, and we're pretty broken. But we're in unity that we needed to come back. And we come back for somebody. And, and hence the title of um, our message, Is It You That We Came Back For? Uh, our memories of the house that we're moving into this I've put some little friends there to <laughs> when we brought this house we there was rats running along the sink and there was rats running across the pantry and and um, the only reason we brought it was because it was going on the market and we knew some people that might want to buy it and it's very close to our tiny home and so we brought it um, to protect our quality of life, so to speak. Um, so so we, my memories of this house uh, are all the rats. So I'm up there in our beautiful little slice of heaven and, and uh, finally in the morning I went to bed at four, but between four and six, I had intermittent sleep. And I had this conversation with God, and I said to God, why did I have to leave? Why do I have to leave my little slice of heaven for a rat-infested hole? And God said back to me, why did I have to leave my little slice of heaven and come to a rat-infested earth for you? Will you go for me? So that sort of ended the argument really um, so I know we've come back for somebody we've come back so that somebody will see the difference between when we left and now and hopefully encourage them up this little path it might be somebody on line that watches and seen what we had to give up so we could share a testimony to help them but who do you think in the room that I came back most for? It was for me. Because I needed to let another wagon go. Um, so for me, this is, was salvational for me. But I also know it's not only for me, it's for an encouragement for somebody else. Because that scripture I read in Revelation tells me so, 12, 11, I think it was, they won them by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So Sam always taught us that she'd rather have us, God show us our character flaws now so that we have time to put them right before judgment day. And we got on so well there there wasn't a lot of opportunities for my character to be flawed. <laughs> and I was starting to think I was okay again. It's only when we live with people and community that our flaws show up. So I need needed to come back for me. And uh, I encourage everybody here, if you've 
going through hard times or whatever. It's part of the journey and not to fight it, but let God help you through. So the first Sunday we're coming back and this is our welcome to Ohura. And this is not even where it normally gets. I've never seen mud here. Um, and that's fine because I'm in a four-wheel drive. And this is right in Martry. I've never seen water there before. And um, I'm having a little play with me and there's actually a trailer load of stuff behind me but you can't see. But our other car was an electric car so it wasn't so good. So we had to go back to Tamaranui and um, recharge it so we could come the other way. So we arrived about two and a half hours after we should have done. We were supposed to be here at 8 and we got here about 10.30. So this is our containers getting picked up again. Now, we were supposed to come a week earlier, but the trucks came out and they went to lift our containers and they couldn't lift them. And the real blessing of that was um, one of them was full of books and the other was full of our furniture well, some of our furniture, but it couldn't, li couldn't lift either of them. So the blessing is that now one, one container uh, of books has now been spread all over the n Northland, and that'll become a container for my workshop because we don't have much room next door. Um, and there were some miracles of those. There's uh, my little digger with a special OSHA-approved forklift attachment. Um, comes with a safety manual, it's very short. It's uh, only a couple of words, keep clear. <laughs> um, and anyway, we managed to uh, lift that on there. Most of the time it stayed at down at the back, but um, in order to move we couldn't have the blade down, so um, it was quite unstable, but that's one of the trucks being loaded. And those particular ones are going to Whangarei and there's a warehouse there with the forklift that can distribute them. We had some guys, another miracle on the Wednesday night, they rang up from Auckland and said, we've got a container going to Rarotonga. Do you still have some books we can take? Um, I don't have a photo I can show you. There's plenty of photos, but they're all got us in it and it's not about us. But they loaded this van so really full. So there's um, two pallets of great controversies and probably half a pallet of National Sunday laws heading off to Rarotonga as we speak. Um, and we had all the books were distributed around the Northland within four days. And I see that as a blessing because we saw what happened with the last lockdown. Northland got locked isolated and locked off pretty quick and having books here is one thing but trying to get them around the country so th now they are in lots of little places around Northland which makes them safer because the day is coming when these books will be extremely valuable and hard to get. We were warned in Matthew 24 verse 3 that when the disciples uh, we're sitting on the Mount of Olive. The disciples came to Jesus privately. Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of your coming and an end of the world? And in verse 4 he answers, Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Whenever somebody asks a question or you look on an ingredients label, the first item is always the most important. In verse 5 he said, Many shall come in my name, saying I am Christ, and deceive many. So his first two statements talk about deception. In verse 11, And many false prophets shall arrive and deceive many. And verse 24 is, For there shall arise false Christs, false prophets, and show great signs and wonders, and so much of it were at all possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So my question is, do you think deception might be a problem at the end of time? I think it will be. 
and there'll be many deceptions, but one of the most destructive deceptions is self-deception. When we think we're fit for heaven. I remember saying down here once before we left, I was um, a bit upset at the time, and I remember saying to a couple of people, I came here thinking I was ready for heaven, and now I, yeah, I'm um, totally unfit for heaven. And I was saying that in the wrong way, and I praise God now that I've seen that, because while I think I'm fit for heaven, I'm surely deceived. We get to heaven by God's grace, not by um, any of our works. But our fruit should be such. And it's very different. We should Our behaviour and our changes should be because of our love for God. We can keep the Sabbath, but it doesn't get us to heaven if we're doing it the wrong way. We keep the Sabbath because we love God and we know that it's his special day. Do you notice how we always seem to make our, ourselves either bigger or smaller, which is pride, so we either think we're better than others or we make ourselves like worms where we're not as good as others and therefore imply that God made a mistake with us. Both are equally as bad. Without God, none of us have anything to offer. If I judge someone else, it shows me that I think I'm better than them. And I think we all do that. We look at other people and, and we compare ourselves. My mum used to tell me, never compare yourself with the best, compare, never compare yourself with the worst, compare yourself with the best. But there is only one we compare ourselves with, and that's Christ. And when we do, if we do judge other people, what we're saying is that we think we're God with a little g. And there's only room for one God in heaven. And then there's the most scariest verses I know of in the Bible, and that's Matthew seven twenty one to 23. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. So are these non-believers talking? He's talking about? These are believers, because they are calling him Lord, Lord. And many will say me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not cast out devils in thy name and done many wonderful works? And then I'll profess them, I never knew you. Depart me from me who do iniquity. It's about a relationship with God and knowing God. It's a bit like I can say here, who knows Chris Luxton? Anybody? So what would happen if I went up to, because I know Chris Luxton, if I went up to his place today with my suitcase and said, right, I'm moving in. What do you think he would say to me? Get lost, I don't know who you are. Because he wouldn't say that to everybody because there's some people that would knock on his door and he'd say, come on in. But they're people he knows. And yet we do the same with God. We all talk about wanting to go to heaven but we don't want to know the God of heaven. My mum... Um, she used to, uh, she, didn't, she didn't really want to know God, but she wanted to be in heaven. And we remember saying to her one day, why would you want to be in heaven? You don't even want to know God here. Heaven would be a torturous place for you. See, the only reason we won't be in heaven is because we wouldn't like it there. If we choose not to have a relationship with God here, we would hate being stuck with him for eternity. 
So we have an opportunity to get to know God. And now is the time. Matthew 7, 1 to 2. Judge not, lest ye be not... Judge not that ye be not judged, for the judgment we judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. You can tell that's a tongue twister for me. <laughs> this scripture reminds me of when I worked at the bridge program <coughs> as a drug and alcohol counsellor, and eventually every client would say something to me like, I vowed I'd never be like my mother or my father. And here they were in a drug centre doing the very same thing. And this scripture says that if we judge, w the very same thing will come upon us. And the other thing that happens when we do that, they all made a vow I would never be like. So they judge the appearance when that's God's choice to judge and they vowed they'd never be like them, which is like putting a curse on yourself. And nearly every client I ever had would come out with that statement. And then when I read this verse, I started to understand why. We have to be careful what we say. And why does... Beholdest thou the mote in my brother's eye, but considereth not the beam that is in thy own eye. And I found this little cartoon which quite I quite liked, because here we have someone with a little speck, but we managed to point that out to them, and really it's us the one that needs something pointed out to Howbeit they say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote from thy eye and behold the beam is in thy own eye. This re reminds me of a stage show I did uh, years ago, Jesus Christ Superstar actually. And um, while Christians were protesting against it, I can tell you it's the only show I've ever been involved with where months, up to six months later, the cast just keep, you know, we'd go on the Sunday and have, have their booze ups and the cast would just burst into tears and nobody could understand why because the word of God had effect. It was more or less Matthew word for word um, and the cast was never the same and I was never the same. Not that I would say I'd take somebody there to lead them to God but God touched everybody there and this little skit reminds me of one of the lines in there. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you see more clearly to take the speck of out of our brother's eyes. We need to be looking at ourselves and on this journey of giving up our possessions, we need to give up our rights to our own way and learn to die to self, which has come up a few times this morning. And I loved our Sabbath school message. It really fitted with this message. And yet we have no idea because you do a different Sabbath school lesson. And, um, but it tied in really well. We shouldn't be like the Pharisee to the publican. Instead of saying things like, and I used to say this, it used to be a code word between a good friend of mine before he died. We'd say it every time we found ourselves gossiping about somebody else. One of us would break the cycle by saying, thank God we're not like those other people. We should be saying, thank God for showing us our faults. Because when we see something in somebody else, we know that that's something in us that God is trying to deal with. The parable of the ten virgins teaches us that now is the time to be getting ready. Getting the extra oil, the Holy Spirit, and let him change our character. Because our character is non-transferable. And I believe that's the difference between the two lots, was that um, 
one allowed God to change their character and they were fit for heaven and the others didn't. The foolish virgins had information but not transformation of character which only comes from responding to the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. All changes are conditional upon our approval. Doesn't matter how much God wants to change us. If we say, no God, I want to keep that. If I want to keep that wagon, I want to keep that horse. God will allow us to keep it. He has to, because he's a God of love. And the moment he does something that is not by our free will, he becomes a dictatorial God. And my God is not. I've always had free choice. And people have the choice whether to love him or not. And everybody here is the same. But I can't give you my character changes. But what I can do is live and hopefully you might see that if God could do it for him, because you know what I was like, and I don't think I was terribly bad, but from God's eyes I was. And I'm not there yet either. So forgive me when I do slip, but my intention is to try and become more like Christ every day. I've come to the conclusion I'd rather have my flaws brought to my attention now when I have time to <coughs> repent and ask God's help to change than to leave it to judgment day and have to try and explain to God why I chose to hold on to my anger or bitterness, self-righteousness. As Sam would say, do you love Jesus more than this sin? And we need to ask that for everything we do that we know is right, not right. Or more than this thought, how do we overcome one thought at a time? Because I can't last like Paul for a day. It happens thought by thought. And Sam often says, and I think I've got a head like hers, is if you're in my head, you would, wouldn't want to know what's going in my head. <coughs> so I have to catch every thought. Because the devil's very good at planting thoughts. And um, I have to learn, if it doesn't sound like God, it's not God. So what about you? Where are you at? Is there something in your life you need to give up? Whether it's something physical or a character flaw? Or do you simply depend upon yourself instead of God? If you're a bit like me, I'm a bit of a worrier. But what does that say? It says, God, I don't trust you. There's the old story about the guy of the Niagara Falls and he's walking backwards and forwards and the crowds are cheering and they're all excited. And then he asks, do you think I can carry somebody across in the wheelbarrow? And the crowd go, yes, yes, do it, do it. And then he asks for somebody to hop in the wheelbarrow. Suddenly there's silence. But God's asking us to hop in the wheelbarrow. It seems an impossible task, but he can get us across where no one else can. The problem is when you hop in the wheelbarrow, once you're on your way, you can't get out. Well, you can, but it's a long way down. God wants us to trust in him completely in everything. So I invite you to hop in God's wheelbarrow today and not get out. This is a video. Sorry, I'll just stop that for a sec. What I love about the hymns is there's so many of them have an amazing story. So I pray that as we watch the story behind this hymn that it will touch your hearts. And if you're like me, um, there's bound to be some tears in your eyes.
We got sound. No, we don't have sound. David? Can somebody get... These missionaries chose as their place of service to go to North India, a place that could best be described as savage. These tribes were famous... took place in Wales, England. And as a result of this revival, many missionaries were called on to foreign mission fields. And many of these missionaries chose as their place of service to go to North India, a place that could best be described as savage. These tribes were famous for a group of men known as headhunters, who as a sign of greatness in their tribe would take the heads of their enemies and hang them on their walls. And it was into this savage tribe that these missionaries came and obviously they were not welcomed by these tribes but still they they knew they were called by God and so they continued to share their faith and they finally reached out to one family who accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ and this man and his wife and two sons were so contagious about Jesus that they were beginning to lead other villagers and other people from their tribe to Jesus and the tribal chief got wind of, of, of their faith. And so he called a meeting of the tribe and he, he captured this family and he brought them before the tribe. And he said to the man, he said, renounce Jesus Christ as your savior or something bad's gonna happen to you. He said, we're gonna kill your children. And the man, he loved his children. He looked down at his sons and he, he loved them, but he knew that he couldn't renounce Jesus Christ. So he said the words to this famous song he said, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And the archers pulled back their arrows and they shot dead his two sons. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow sons laid there before him on the ground dead the tribal chief said I'm going to give you another chance renounce Christ or I'm going to kill your wife and the man looked down at his sons and he looked at his wife whom he loved so much his partner in life but he knew what scripture said that he needed to acknowledge God acknowledge Christ before men and he said the second line to this famous song he said though none go with me still I will follow no turning back, no turning back. And the archers killed his wife. No none go with me, still I will fall. No none go with me, still I will fall. No none go with me, still I his two sons and his wife lying on the ground in front of him the tribal chief came before him again and said renounce Christ or this time we'll kill you and the man realizing that he had nothing left in this world looked up at heaven and said the last lines to this song he said the cross before me the world behind me no turning back no turning back and in anger the tribal chief gave the order and the archers killed the man.
now with the man and his two children and his wife dead, the chief stood before this family speechless. He couldn't believe what his eyes had just seen and he realized that through the faith of this man that this God must be real. This Jesus who this man was willing to die for must be real and on the spot the reports tell us that this chief accepted Christ as his savior. And throughout the, the following weeks and months, the rest of the tribes began to accept Christ as their Savior. All because one man and his family were willing to stand up and say, I've decided to follow Jesus. Though no one goes with me, I'm still going to follow. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back. No turning back. So if you'd like to take God to the next level, I'd like, if you'd like him to help you surrender everything to him and let go of self, um, please join me in prayer. I'm going to pray a prayer that's in that um, book that I showed earlier. Lord, so we'll just pray. Lord, I'll do anything you ask me to do, no matter how embarrassing or painful. I'll go wherever you want me to go, no matter how reluctant I feel. I'll give up whatever you ask for, no matter how precious it seems to me. If following you means losing my family, I will follow. If it means embarrass, being embarrassed, I will follow. If it means losing my career, reputation, or the lo loss of my abilities, I will follow. Whatever you ask, I will do. Amen. So we're going to sing our final uh, hymn song. The words will be on the screen and the music on the screen. So, um, yeah, if you just sing along with, with us, it would be great. Here it is. Mm -hmm. 